Orders of the day. Order, Madam Minister. Question to Madam Minister. Government orders, government bills. Reading of Bill C-45, the Cannabis Act, and on the amendment of Mr. Nicholson. Okay. Uh, who is up next? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member, or Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it gives me a pleasure to rise on this bill, uh, particularly given the fact that uh, the policies as they pertain to cannabis have been uh, nothing short of an abject failure. Uh, we have, over successive decades, uh, let our young people down. In fact, if you take a look at the numbers, uh, the cohort from 15 to 19 have 21 percent uh, prevalence, use of cannabis. If you go the next cohort up, it's 20 to 24, that's 30 percent. It represents the highest levels of cannabis use by young people on the planet. In fact, one-third of young people will try cannabis before the age of 15. And uh, I know I've heard many times from members opposite that they're concerned about uh, having uh, cannabis being in the hands of young people. The problem is it's already happening and it's already happening in greater levels than it's happening anywhere else on the planet. And the only way you can categorize being dead last on the planet is a failure. And certainly to me, it speaks to the need to do something differently. We can't be ostriches on this. We can't bury our head in the sand and pretend a problem does not exist. And it isn't just our young people that are being let down. Uh, we spend uh, two to three billion dollars in enforcement of these failed laws. We spend or about seven or eight billion dollars of profit go to illegal organized crime organizations that fund illicit activities. And uh, having been on the police services board in Durham Region and seeing the impact of grow ops and the danger that our frontline officers are placed in trying to enforce these disastrously failed policies, I know firsthand just how much this change is needed. It's time to stop play pretend. It's time to stop ignoring this issue and to finally do something about it. Mr. Speaker, I'd look at the example in my time at Hard and Stroke where I was the executive director of, of, of what we did in tobacco uh, and how we targeted uh, tobacco to take prevalence rates among young people well over 50 percent and through sustained efforts of denormalization uh, and through a public intervention have gotten that now half, half the levels of what cannabis is today. So here is cannabis, an illegal substance, double that what a, what a legal substance is. And I think the example of what we did in tobacco around having those campaigns and denormalization offer an excellent path for us to move forward. Because we know we have two objectives at the front of our mind. Number one is to keep cannabis, cannabis out of the hands of young people, something that we have done an abysmal job of doing to date, total failure. Two, to dry out the billions of dollars in illicit profit that is flowing to criminal organizations. And on that basis, if those are two markers that we want to go for, uh, this bill, I think, takes us a long way in that direction. I want to thank the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation, headed by the Honourable Anne McClellan, and the incredible work done uh, by experts in public health uh, experts in, uh, in justice, in policing, in public safety, in substance abuse, in mental health, who came together and who were instrumental in creating this bill, that will now say, yes, the cannabis will be legal for adults, so 30 grams uh, dried, either for personal use or to be shared, will be legal, that small quantities will be allowed to be grown, uh, so if an individual wants to grow uh, uh, marijuana, they're able to do so, uh, four plants, no higher than one meter in height per residence. Uh, so, but at the same time that we bring in that regime to legalize it for adults, uh, we bring in very strict regulations to keep it out of the hands of youth. And that's particularly important because the research shows us that where cannabis is at its most deadly and its most concerning uh, is for our young people and damage to their mental health. Uh, and so we're going to have to obviously invest in public education uh, ed campaigns and the type of denormalization efforts that we did uh, with tobacco. But on top of that, for the first time, this bill will make it a criminal offense to sell to a minor. They will create severe penalties for anybody who will engage youth 
in cannabis-related offenses. And most importantly, well not most importantly, also very importantly, it's going to block marketing and advertising to children, something that we should have done from day one when dealing with tobacco. Now, to make sure that a young person who makes an error isn't burdened with a criminal record that will then, frankly, wreak havoc on their later life, and unfortunately we see that all too often, we will say for minors who are caught with an amount under five grams that they're not going to get a criminal record for it. But make no mistake, this bill targets full force uh, the use of cannabis by young people and comes down like a hammer on anybody who would seek to, uh, to sell or use uh, young people uh, under the age, well, the provinces get to determine the age uh, uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in the conduct of, uh, of anything to do with cannabis. On the supply side, this bill also brings in a uh, number of important measures. Uh, one of the big concerns with cannabis today is uh, somebody who's purchasing it has no idea what they're getting, uh, either the levels of THC uh, or if there's anything else cut inside of the cannabis. Um, this will ensure that the supply is both safe, uh, that it is securely cleared, uh, and that it's federally licensed. So for adults who make the decision that they are going to use it, um, that it's done in a safe uh, and uh, least harm way, uh, uh, the way that causes the least amount of harm. The other thing that's happening in concurrence with this bill is Bill C-46. And while that's a different bill, I think it bears mentioning, uh, worth mentioning uh, that the two work uh, extremely importantly in tandem with one another. Now, some have said, well, what about uh, driving impaired, as if the problem doesn't exist today. The problem very much, unfortunately, does exist today, where police uh, and law enforcement are given no tools to deal with somebody who would be driving under the influence of drugs, not just cannabis. Uh, and we know the deadly impacts that impaired driving has. We've made great strides in dealing with the uh, impact in alcohol, and in fact, Bill C-46 goes even further to make further uh, advancements in public safety uh, when it comes to drinking and driving. But Bill C-46, for the first time, is going to set up a regime, and uh, the government will also be providing resources to ensure that law enforcement also has the ability uh, to, uh, to charge and uh, recognize anybody who is driving high. And that's something that's incredibly important, Mr. Speaker, uh, something that's an important part of the fabric of this bill. Uh, I want to state in, in closing uh, that the balance uh, in, uh, in, in, in public safety uh, between, on the one hand, ensuring that illicit dangerous substances are kept out of the hands of people generally, uh, and, on the other hand, ensuring that uh, the regime that we have when it's not working, that we find a different path, is incredibly important. And I think what we're seeing here in cannabis is that appropriate balance, making sure that young people are protected, that we keep cannabis out of their hands, that we have robust uh, education to tell them about the damage that cannabis can do to a developing mind. Uh, and, on the other hand, looking at the fact that existing policies have been complete failures, uh, that keep trying to uh, reforce a regime um, that uh, when m almost a third of the population is using it uh, isn't working and it's time for a different approach. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member, he talked about the need for, and I quote, robust education with regards to marijuana use, particularly among young people. And I would agree with him that this seems to be a very important uh, provision that should be within this piece of legislation going forward. Now, the interesting point, though, is the Liberals are actually only attributing less than $2 million per year uh, with regards to public education around marijuana. And in terms of actually implementing that funding, it's actually not going to be implemented until right before the legislation comes into effect on July 1st, 2018. So it seems a little late in the game to start educating the public when it's in tandem with the legislation itself. I'm wondering if the Honourable Member could comment on how this provides robust education. Well, Parliamentary Secretary. Well, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing here today is setting out the framework for regulating and legalizing marijuana. Uh, what is going to follow is the exact plan of how we're going to ensure that public, public education is further. Uh, what we don't want to do is, unfortunately, what was done. Uh, by the previous government, which was nearly no dollars for public education on health at all. 
I, I look at tobacco and the rates of tobacco uh, the, uh, usage and how that impacts young people. The national tobacco strategy was thrown in the garbage. The dollars that were put every single year for public education on making sure that young people didn't smoke tobacco, not expended at all. It's time to turn a page on the dark time that occurred in public health on a lack of public awareness. And certainly we want to do that not only on tobacco, or excuse me, on cannabis, but also on tobacco and on public health issues generally. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Couch and Malahat Langford. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Parliamentary Secretary and the Minister of Public Safety. Um, you know, you may mention it was a speech of dropping the hammer down on anyone who, who operates outside the way Bill C-45 is written. And, and C-45 certainly does have some very harsh punishments. For someone who's over the age of 18 who distributes to someone who's younger, they could face up to 14 years in prison for an indictable offence. Or if it's a summary conviction, it could be $5,000 or a term of six months. Uh, my question to the, to the Secretary is, is that if we have a household where pot plants are allowed to be grown in it and we have an inadvertent situation where someone over the age of 18 accidentally lets their marijuana get in the hands of someone who's younger, how are we making sure we're not dropping the hammer on a family unit and possibly sending a parent guardian to jail for something that happened by accident? I just hope that the government has taken that consideration and maybe has a plan to deal with it. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Let me, let me thank you very much for the question. And uh, when I go back to the number that I stated during my speech, that roughly one third of children under the age of 15 will try uh, marijuana. Uh, that is an abhorrent statistic. And let me say to any parent or guardian that is going to have cannabis in their possession that they need to be incredibly careful uh, about, about where that cannabis is and how they contain it. That's already a circumstance that's existing today, and unfortunately, it's easier for a young person today to get a joint than it is for them to get a cigarette or a bottle of beer. And that's a circumstance we have to change. But I hope this bill sends the clearest possible message that we have absolutely no tolerance, none, zero, for anybody who seeks to sell this product or drugs generally to children. It's an abhorrent act, particularly when a young person has a developing mind. And that's why we recognize in this legislation that we need to draw that thick black line to say that it's totally and utterly unacceptable, that there's a major difference between somebody who's an adult and makes a decision to use cannabis and a child who's at risk and exposed. And comments, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North in 45 seconds, uh, please. Not a problem, Mr. Speaker. And I really appreciate the comments uh, from my colleague. It is such an important issue. And one of the things that I found very striking was the fact that when you compare Canada's uh, rate of youth that have used cannabis compared to any other country in the developed world, from my understanding, what I'm being told is that we are, in fact, the worst country. In other words, it hasn't worked over the last decade. And for the first time, is it not safe to say that we have a government that's really dealing with the issue of protecting our young people and dealing with the issue in terms of uh, the criminality of the... Well, Parliamentary Secretary, in 45 seconds or less, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely. To, to my honourable colleague, he's 100 per cent right. This is about public health, first and foremost. It's about protecting our children as well, first and foremost. And I look at um, the, the complete failure that we've had, uh, and I'm glad that I'm with a government that has the courage to act, to stop pretending, to stop pretending that this problem is magically going to go away when year over year the numbers get higher and higher. This bill takes action. The action is appropriate. And I have great belief, just as we were successful in tobacco, that we're going to be successful with cannabis. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Kamloops. Uh, thank Thompson you, Caribou. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to add my comments to the debate on C-45, which is the Cannabis Act. And, I, you know, I think it's interesting, of course, the Liberals, when they were the third party in the House, wanted to uh, put out some uh, things in the window to encourage uh, voters. But I don't think they ever actually thought that they were going to have to follow through with this particular policy. Um, they made a lot of promises in the election, including balanced budgets and electoral reform and, of course, uh, legalizing cannabis. 
to be quite frank, I would have much preferred they kept their promise on a balanced budget than keep their promise in terms of legalizing cannabis. I think most Canadians, including you know the policy of our party, is children should not be adversely impacted, young teenagers, young adults, and have records for having a small amount of cannabis. And certainly that is something that would have been maybe important to move forward in terms of a ill thought out plan that probably is gonna have some significant, uh, you know, it'll create some significant damages down the way. So what their stated policy objective, and this is gonna be monitored and watched by all Canadians because the Liberal government is saying two things. They're saying one, we are gonna protect our children and two, we're gonna get organized crime out of this business and that the rest of us are our heads that are in the sand like ostriches. So, so they are gonna be held account year after year after year as the data comes in. Have they actually achieved those two things? Certainly there is a number of people out there who are very concerned that they are not, or the design of this legislation is not gonna achieve those outcomes. And I think I'm gonna start and I'm gonna read a couple of excerpts from, I think it was a very good article that came out in the Canadian Medical Association Journal a couple of days ago. And I think it's important to note that the Minister of Health, of course, is also a physician. And this is her professional body. So her professional body is advising regarding this legislation and they have some pretty important things to say. And I think perhaps she should reflect on what they're saying because they are very expert in this area. So what have they said? First of all, the title, Cannabis Legislation Fails to Protect Canada's Youth. And this was uh, an article by Dr. Kelsall. And again, I don't have time to read it all, but I certainly encourage anyone that's interested. It was in the um, May 29th Canadian Medical Association Journal to read the details. So uh, here's some quotes. The purported purpose of the act is to protect public health and safety, yet some of the act's provisions appear starkly at odds with this objective, especially and particularly for Canada's youth. Then she goes into significant detail that I think has been spoken about in the debate up to now in terms of young age and the particularly long-term consequences and impact of cannabis use on the developing brain and really saying that it's not until the age of 25 where um, there's more fulsome development of the brain that it is less impactful. So what did the government do? They said, listen, at a minimum, her, the medical association says, at a minimum, let's make the age 21 for legalization. Because up to that, it is a real issue. So what do they do? They make the legalization age 18. So that is, first of all, the first and significant area of concern. So the next, they talk about, um, you know, drawing on the work of the federal task force and that it recommended taking a public health approach. Yet in the bill, it has set the age. So 21 years, absolutely. Um, their next area of concern is the area of personal cultivation of up to four marijuana plants. Uh, what they say about this is allowing personal cultivation will increase the risk of diversion and access to cannabis that is not subject to any quality or potency controls. So uh, I think that's really important. You know, they, they talk about use, and I think, I believe there's been a lot of studies that talk about, in actual fact, um, children when they're first, uh, the first time they smoke a cigarette is often at a young age, and they've taken from their parents' supply, they've gone into their parents' package of cigarettes, and that is their first exposure to cigarettes. So we now have a situation where having uh, cannabis, whether it's purchased legally or grown in the home, where it's, it's become normalized, and to be quite frank, I think um, children's access is gonna be much easier than it currently is, and especially in the case of the homegrown, and particularly in the case of the 
the, um, the potency issues. So, I mean, the other issue with the home growing, not only do I think children are going to have more access, why they ever put this in there, they didn't need to have home grown in there at all. I think if they're going to do this, it should be absolutely all purchase and quality control. So they talk about, um, well, we're going to have, they can only have four marijuana plants that can only be a hundred centimeters high. So, so all is fine. Um, Mr. Speaker, who's going to monitor that? Who's going to go around with the measuring tape, measuring the height of the marijuana plants, making and counting them? No one. This is absolutely an unenforceable, uh, piece of legislation and it's absolutely ridiculous to have that in there. The um, insurance, you know, I've dealt with a number of uh, landlords that have come to me over the years in terms of our medical marijuana regime and what's happening there is the landlords have no rights. If someone has a license to grow medical marijuana, they rent a home from someone, the person um, decides they, they're growing their medical marijuana, they perhaps are growing for another person with a license. The landlord comes in and says, what's going on here? They have no rights at all. What happens after that? They lose their insurance. There has been no work that I can see done with the insurance companies, done with uh, uh, real estate associations, done with provinces in terms of what are the impact of this in terms of the homegrown aspect? Um, I could really, I know that I don't have a lot of time, but you know, I, the FCM is here. Many people have noted that they're here and I met with a number of representatives from our uh, local area and they say, we have a mess right now. This is a mess and we don't know where it's gonna end up, but we're very fearful that there's gonna be a lot of downloading on us. So um, the organized crime, I. Uh, again, perhaps this is going to work in terms of taking it out of organized crime. There's no guarantee. I suspect that the prices are going to be high and between the diversion from the home grown, because no one's monitoring four plants, uh, that there is going to continue to be a significant element of organized crime. And you know what, to be frank, if this goes ahead, I hope that I'm wrong, but I don't think that they have created the right circumstances that they're going to remove organized crime out of this particular business. And you know, perhaps in many ways they'll be getting into the, the legal component of it. So um, Mr. Speaker, I think if I'm going to conclude in terms of what my concerns are, Absolutely, age is number one. Second of all, the ability to grow in the home. And the third is just a personal thing that I find to be particularly offensive. When they came out with great pride to announce their movement forward to um, you know, move forward with their cannabis legislation, they said, we're gonna have it in place for July 1st. It's gonna be there for Canada Day 2018. Well, Mr. Speaker, 2018, when I'm watching the fireworks on Canada Day, I hope that people don't sort of say, this is what's making it special because the Liberals think that we can't enjoy our celebrations of our country watching the, the lights and the, uh, the different displays without being stoned. I think it's incredibly offensive that they want to attach legalization to Canada Day, a day that we should be filled with pride and they just think it's important that perhaps people can enjoy being stoned during these festivities. Really offensive. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you. I hope they listen to me on at least the issue of age and the issue of the home growing. Thank you. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I guess where I disagree with the member across the way is that there's a time to act. And we have seen uh, over the last decade more and more of our young people. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, as I say, when you look around the world and you see that uh, Canada is, has the highest per capita usage from young people than any other developed country in the world, that we have a serious problem here. And when you take a look at uh, an action, this is something in which more and more American states are moving towards. Uh, this is something that uh, will ultimately uh, deal with the issue in getting fewer kids uh, using cannabis. Um, I believe it will have a significant impact 
on criminal activities to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars that are funneled into criminal activities. This is a, an action plan that at least three parties inside this House seem to be getting behind, but the Conservatives seem to be out of touch with what Canadians really believe, the need for action. Why is the Conservative Party opposing the need for action to protect our young people and deal with criminal activities? Well, member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I will repeat what I said during my speech. I hope that they're right about this decreasing use. But I am strongly concerned that it's going to actually go in the opposite direction. We will um, have an escalating use. And that was the experience in Colorado. What they went from was a baseline to increased use. And we just talked about uh, when you normalize something, when your parents have a package of joints sitting on the counter, it is normalized, it is accessible, and I worry, and I hope I'm wrong, that this will actually increase use in our young adults as opposed to what their public health objectives are. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Couch in Malahat Langford. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her speech. Um, I, I know that uh, many members in this House have raised concerns about the age, and, and I know that the government did uh, struggle a bit with uh, setting the age of 18. I mean, this legislation does allow provinces to harmonize it. But I, I think the thing is that we have to remember is that at age 18, we trust Canadian citizens to cast a ballot for everyone in this chamber. At age 18, we trust Canadians uh, have the maturity to join our Canadian armed forces and go and fight abroad for us. A, a great deal of responsibility. And I know there are concerns about the brain because it's developing under the age of 25. I'd just like to hear the members uh, reflection on that, the fact that at age 18 we already give people so much responsibility and uh, just if she can comment a bit further on that and how the government had to sort of find a right balance. Thank you. Kamloops, Thompson, Mr. Terrible. Speaker, this is not an issue, a situation of trust. This is a situation of science and the neurological development of the brain. You only have to have been in an emergency department where a 20-year-old who has smoked somewhat excessively has come in with their first psychotic break, knowing that it could have been prevented, knowing that they're now into a lifelong uh, psychiatric illness. It is not about trust. This is about people and how young adult brains can respond to the use of cannabis, between, especially between those ages of 18, 21, and of course, uh, Obviously, 25 is the recommended age in terms of when it's not going to impact to that degree. So, not trust. This is about um, lifelong impacts, psychiatric illness, the um, schizophrenia, and all those other sorts of issues. In comments, we have time for a 30-second question and a 30-second answer. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Grasswood. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. I want to thank my colleague from Kamloops, Thompson and Caribou. Um, her speech about homegrown has really hit home, I think, with residents in my city. Last week, I stopped at a feed and garden store in Saskatoon. They have already been put on alert. They are the ones that are going to police who buys enough material for four plants in the household. We already know municipalities in this country and in our cities have no resources to police these plants in your house. And now stores in my city have been told they will be the ones that will record who's buying the materials for these plants. Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou, in uh, 30 seconds yeah. or less, please. So, so the, uh, the idea of four plants and measured is absolutely ridiculous. Um, I have not heard from insurance companies. I know the insurance industry is very concerned. I know the real estate industry is very concerned. Why do they have to go there? Because the, it just doesn't make sense that they're going there. If they want to make it accessible, make the quality, the toxicity, create it in a controlled environment with health and safety behind it. So, so to me, the four plants in a home is absolutely a giant mistake within this legislation. Before we go back to debate, I just want to mention to the honourable members that sometimes it seems like the chair doesn't see you or doesn't quite put you in the rotation. And I notice some, or one in particular, getting dramatic and making a little bit of a scene. I don't want to mention the person's name, but 
in the back of the, and I remember being in the, cha in, the, in the chairs and sometimes thinking, boy, that speaker really doesn't like me. Believe me, I like all of you equally. It's just that making a room, uh, making, making a list in the back of my mind, and uh, please, please be persistent. Please, it's pretty bad when the speaker gets heckled. Come on, guys. <laughs> what I'm telling you is, please be persistent in getting up and trying to be recognized, and uh, the list will be filled. There's nothing more frustrating for a speaker than coming to the mental list and the person isn't getting up or isn't uh, trying to ask a question. So uh, just a little uh, reminder of how things work around here, and there is a rotation uh, through the parties. Reprise de débat, l'honorable député de Belle The honorable member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to my colleagues. Today, we're talking about C-45. We're talking about a bill, a liberal plan, that many people are talking about. People were talking about this well before the election of the current Prime Minister, who was leader of the Liberal Party back then, who was aspiring to become Prime Minister. He talked about his own habits and said afterwards that he was going to start this project. What must be noted at the very beginning, a problem that we now have to deal with, with this bill, is what we're asking for some time now, the details, the plan. That is an aspect that's been missing for far too long. When a candidate for the position of prime minister, uh, well, who was, of course, candidate to be an elected official, it was very vague, and it created a great deal of uncertainty. And we've seen it with the legal system. We've seen it with law enforcement, even on the Public Safety Committee. It came up a year and a half ago when the Liberals uh, took power. There were questions being asked of the RCMP of how they would interpret the existing law, how they would apply it, taking into account the long-term vision of the Prime Minister. When it comes to public safety, there are other consequences of a lack of planning, a lack of vision, a lack of explanations from the government. One of the consequences, and this is a consequence that we are still experiencing now, this consequence could continue even after the bill is passed. Consequences for Canadians who cross the border to the United States despite legalization. There are, in more and more American states, there are Canadian citizens crossing the border to visit family, to take a vacation, to work, who are asked outright, have you smoked marijuana before? And are then judged and sometimes turned back. The Americans have the right to do so, but one can quickly conclude that this is very problematic for something that is legal in Canada to have significant consequences on Canadians in a relationship despite the current turbulence and the behavior of the current president, President Trump. This is a relationship that is nonetheless extremely important and having fluidity at the border is important for many Canadians for the reasons I've already outlined. This is another aspect that is missing. And as my colleague from Cowich and Malhat Langford asked during question period and previous question periods, there are different international obligations that have not yet been resolved. We do not yet have a strategy for dealing with those. And that is a consequence of starting a process, Mr. Speaker, which despite the work of the task force and the report they did, and we thank them for their work, lacked transparency until the bill was tabled. But let's talk about the bill, what's in it and what's not in it. Before getting into the substance of the bill, yes, in second reading, we will support this bill. It's time to go forward with this debate. Even though we support it, there are still significant concerns and questions. Some will be resolved through the committee process. Others, however, are thornier issues. One that comes to mind 
is the responsibility of provinces and territories. Mr. Speaker, we're looking at the level of uncertainty, which I described earlier. One of the biggest uncertainties has to do with shared responsibility with the provinces. There are important questions that, that will be asked when it comes to taxation, revenue, When we discuss legalization, citizens often come to see us to say if we legalize at least a positive outcome will be this revenue that will no longer go to organized crime that will go to the government. However, we know that with the way our country is structured, the issues of taxation will involve the provinces a great deal. The conservatives raised the issue of the rights of those who own buildings where perhaps tenants would like to grow plants. Tenants themselves can set up rules. Uh, this could go before the Régie du Logement in Quebec to set up rules. But all of those questions require a thorough, transparent conversation with the provinces. And I would submit to you, Mr. Speaker, that in my opinion, what I've concluded so far is that this is something that has not been done yet. And that is a major problem with this bill. It's a problem with other questions that we're hoping to get answers to. One, we need to better understand the role that we are asking provinces to play. In Canada, Governing can be very complicated. There are different issues for the country. We, we know that our country is vast. We hope, however, pro that provinces will have their word to say. We are far from convinced that they've had the opportunity to explain their concerns and how they want to see this structured. One argument that the government might present is well, let's pass the bill, and then we can talk about it. I would submit, yet again, Mr. Speaker, that as a parliamentarian, as a parliamentarian from Quebec, I conclude that I need much more information on what provinces will be required to do and what provinces could require on their part before signing this blank check. We've supported the approach of the government up to a certain point, of course. Because if we look at the last few years, we often talk about the English expression, the, the war on drugs. There's a great deal of it mentioned in the media. This was popularized by Ronald Reagan in the 80s when he was president. What we've concluded, and we agree with the government on this point, is that it is an approach that has failed. Simply closing one's eyes and saying that we're just going to punish and punish and punish is not an approach right now that really promotes education and prevention or helps youth or cultural communities, different segments of the public who too often are victims of profiling and discrimination in the face of the legal system. I don't want to generalize, but in some cases, they can be targeted by law enforcement. If we look on the American side, look at the way marijuana is categorized there. It's a drug that's classified at, in the hierarchy of dangerous and serious drugs. Higher, it's classified higher than heroin and cocaine. When we conclude that there is a discourse let me give you an example that goes beyond borders. There's a lot of fear. We need to seize the opportunity to really set the record straight. And one thing we need to do when it comes to discrimination and the fact that too often we see the same citizens, the same members of our society being punished unfairly or too severely regarding their recreational use of marijuana, that's the reason for which we want decriminalization. And we've been asking for it for some time. For us, it is unacceptable. Let's take the example of the Prime Minister. It's unacceptable for the Prime Minister or a member of his family 
considering the privileges that they benefit from, considering their status in a soci our society, be able to get away with it, and other members of society are too often discriminated against, and then they're stuck with a criminal record for all time, with all the negative impact that means for something that will soon be legal. And so we demand amnesty, we demand an interim decriminalization. I know that my time is running out, but I will conclude with this. When we talked about revenue, and that's something to be negotiated with the provinces, but what we conclude is that that money can and must serve to educate and prevent. It's time to change the direction of this war on drugs and really go forward with a progressive approach and make sure that it benefits, above all, young people and other segments of the public instead of simply betting on approach that does not go along with what was promised by the Prime Minister. And so and the rest, perhaps, I will be able to uh, bring up during questions and comments. Questions and comments. Did you, uh, I, I didn't hear the writing name, Mr. Speaker. I guess you called. I guess she called me. I don't know whether it comes through or not. Anyway, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I congratulate the, uh, the member on his uh, on his remarks. I thought they were uh, very thorough, well thought out, and uh, and and very fair. And I'm pleased to uh, uh, to hear that the uh, that his party uh, will be supporting C45 uh, going to committee. And I do hope there is a a, a robust uh, debate uh, there. Um, a, a couple of questions. Uh, having been uh, one in a uh, in a previous government that uh, had actually proposed uh, the decriminalization of uh, cannabis, that uh, that would have been about back in about 2002, I believe it was. Um, I do see the approach, uh, and I understand where the uh, the party and the member is coming from uh, in that regard because it doesn't make sense to have all these people with these, uh, with these records out there, the cost of a pardon, the loss of their economic opportunity and the country's economic advantage of having been uh, uh, charged uh, for uh, small amounts of, uh, of, of uh, marijuana. Uh, but the problem with the approach on decriminalization, and I think this is where I agree on his, uh, on his point on on going forward with a progressive approach. One of the difficulties with uh, decriminalization in and of itself uh, is you don't uh, deal with, uh, you don't take the criminal element, uh, so to speak, uh, out of the, uh, of the sale of the, uh, uh, of the product on the market. And so my question is, does he not see that as a problem uh, if you just went with the decriminalization? And secondly, on the point of revenue, and I do think there's a lot of people out there who think this is going to mean a gob some money for governments. I don't believe it is, uh, because you have to keep the revenue uh, very stable or uh, and at, at, uh, at fairly low prices or you are, in fact, going to encourage uh, the black market uh, in terms of a legal product. And I wonder what he has to say in that as well. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank my colleague for his comments and questions. On the first point concerning decriminalization, we were disappointed to see that during the election campaign, the Prime Minister was asked about this, and he said that decriminalization should be part of this, and even if it was retroactive, it, 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 it should be part of the discussion of legalization. So he had alluded to that as being part of the plan, but now they're, the Minister of Public Safety is completely closing the door on that, that possibility. So decriminalization if you look at the burden it would place on the criminal system, I mean, we talk a lot about other rulings in this House, like the Jordan ruling, for example, and it's very difficult to administrate all of these different cases. He wants to draw a link between recreational use and minor infractions, infractions and, and the second part of what he said. Now, in the, DB, in the NDP, during the election campaign, and what we've always said, is that the goal is not to decriminalize organized crime or sales, but 
We're talking about university students who might consume pot in their dorm rooms and then who might go out onto the campus and might have a very small amount in their pocket for recreational use. That's what we're talking about. We're not saying that a big criminal organization that grows hundreds of plants shouldn't be punished. So that's the distinction. Finally, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to revenue, I do have the same questions uh, as the member about, about this, and I think the provinces have a role to play in this. And I've noticed that the provinces haven't really been around the table enough, so I hope that they will be they will work more in that regard. We're going to debate the honorable member for Portneuf Jacques Cartier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm speaking this afternoon about Bill C forty five concerning the legalization of cannabis. As my colleague said earlier, this is something that's getting a lot of attention. In my writing, I can tell you that most people are against this bill. I'm having a hard time understanding the Liberal government's motivations when it comes to legalizing marijuana. We need to ask, what benefit does this represent to society? The government says it wants to, present, to protect young people and fight against organized crime. What planet is this government living on? Do they really believe that this will protect youth? Do they really believe that it will eliminate organized crime? It's completely unrealistic, Mr. Speaker. A well-known songwriter in my writing, who is the brother of one of my colleagues, the member for Bécancourt, Nicolas Sorel, the famous Luc Plamondon, who was born uh, in my writing, once wrote a song And I think it really sets the scene for the rest of my speech. So allow me to read you some of the, the lyrics. I won't sing it, but I'll give you some of the lyrics. My head is pounding. I just want to sleep. To lie down on the concrete and become deceased. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't think that we should let this person uh, die. Now, why isn't marijuana already legal in other G7 countries? It's an interesting question, Mr. Speaker. This government wants to legalize marijuana, and they want to be able to boast that they are the first country in the G7 to legalize cannabis. Wow. What a lofty goal. So why didn't the other countries legalize it? The Liberal government wants to take our youth and make them guinea pigs. They want to sacrifice a whole generation by improvising the process of legalizing marijuana. They want to keep an election promise. When they made this promise, you know, they were running third in the polls at the time. And now they're forced to keep their promise, and it's, uh, they find themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place. They backpedaled on electoral reform. They could, they could backpedal on this. It seems like a habit of theirs anyway. But maybe they're just being stubborn in this case. Let's talk about Bill C-45. Now, Mr. Speaker, let's just go back to what's actually in the law under the section called Purpose. Uh, protecting the health of young persons by restricting their access to cannabis. So there will be more cannabis on the market, Mr. Speaker. Protect young persons and others from inducements to use cannabis. But they're basically normalizing this. As a father, I can say it's not good to smoke marijuana. But the government of Canada and the prime minister are saying, hey, there's no problem. Go ahead and smoke. Well, C, provide for the illicit production of cannabis to reduce illicit activities in relation to cannabis. Well, where's, where's the control here? Where are the checks? Next, it says, deter illicit activities in relation to cannabis through appropriate sanctions and enforcement measures. Reduce the burden on the criminal justice system in relation to cannabis. Well, Mr. Speaker, if they want to meet these objectives, they can simply decriminalize it. That would solve the problem. Next, provide access to a quality controlled supply of cannabis and enhance public awareness of the health risks associated with cannabis use. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, this bill will give the minister the power to set the price of various products and services uh, accounted for under the law. What does that mean? It means that the minister will become the boss of this new project. And now, imagine this. His, uh, his logo will be a, a beautiful cannabis leaf and the Liberal Party's uh, logo, and then it'll say, just a little joint. Again, what a lofty goal. I just don't understand, Mr. Speaker. Why is this government making the legalization of pot a priority when there are so many other important issues in our country, like the environment, job creation, economic development, the development of our regions, balancing the budget, and many more? Once again, Mr. Speaker, I simply don't understand what benefit this will bring to Canadian society. I know that this Liberal government's declared objectives are the protection of youth and reducing organized crime in our society. That sounds nice, Mr. Speaker. It's honey to your ears when you're on an election campaign. But does this government understand human psychology? 15% of people will always defy the law. So if I'm doing my math correctly, that means that 85% respect the law. If you legalize marijuana, it's like open bar. It's like you're saying you can consume as much as you want. So what will happen? Well, that 15% will become a potential market of 100%. We're opening the doors to poisoning our youth and saying, hey, there's no problem. Smoke all the joints you want. Enjoy. Mr. Speaker, we're developing the pod market here. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to talk a bit about the consequences of this law. There will be, an in, uh, there will be more damages, more harm to consumers. People who are currently respecting the law may end up consuming it. There will be more traffic accidents caused by people uh, driving while impaired. As I said, there are other countries, regions, and municipalities that have legalized marijuana, and they have data about this. Next, organized crime will force their clients, especially youth, to consume cheaper marijuana. Well, organized crime, those people are a lot smarter than the government. They'll develop new markets with other drugs. They'll lower their prices. And how much will all of this cost to society? How many young people will end up destroying their potential? Schools, police officers, the Association of Pediatricians are all concerned. There are many studies showing that there's a high potential for harm if young people consume pot before the age of 25. I have so many questions, Mr. Speaker, so many concerns. And my residents, my constituents in Pernod Jacques Cartier are concerned too, and they tell me so. At what cost will this law be implemented? How will all of this all of the consequences of legalization be managed, all the training, the awareness, the marketing. How much money will be spent in the future if uh, pot is, is legalized? How much will be spent on raising awareness, on, on public awareness campaigns to protect our youth? What will be the increased health care costs? What will be the impact on our society? What will be the impact on the health and safety of people at work, Mr. Speaker? Are we trying to raise a generation of pod growers? Why risk this irreparable harm? Why this rush to legalize cannabis? How will they manage to uh, measure and quantify the uh, halluc hallucinogens in marijuana, for example? And how can they seriously think that they can control all of these factors? The Liberal government wants to legalize marijuana, but they want to give the provinces the responsibility of distributing it. So what happens when a young person crosses from Quebec to Ontario if they don't have the same legal uh, age of consumption? How will that law be applied? All of these questions have been left unanswered, Mr. Speaker. I encourage the Liberal government to think about this and to withdraw their bill on behalf of our youth who deserve a better future. This is 2017. 
I'm in favor of decriminalization of marijuana, and I'm in favor of raising awareness to help uh, young people say no to drugs. With this bill, uh, there will be serious consequences. Thank you. Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'd like to first say that uh, how much I enjoy working with the member across the way on our environment committee. Uh, on that committee, I have to say, is a very reasonable uh, member of the committee. We, we find common ground on many different issues. Uh, and I guess I wonder why uh, the, the, his reasonable nature doesn't extend uh, to this issue as well. As we've seen, uh, you know, under prohibition in the 1920s, prohibition for alcohol did not work. Uh, criminals were, were allowed to, to make vast amounts of illicit profits. Uh, people were dying because of the composition of alcohol. They didn't know what they were drinking. Uh, and you fast forward to today and we find ourselves in the same environment around cannabis. Uh, we don't know what people are smoking. The criminals are, are, are making vast uh, uh, wealth off of uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, um, drug, and, and we, need to, uh, we need to eliminate prohibition so that we can once again uh, have more responsible uh, uh, consumption of, these, uh, of uh, cannabis, just as we do with alcohol and, and tobacco, for that matter. Um, you know, so, so just as uh, prohibition did not work for alcohol, uh, and for that matter, I mean, I, I guess I'd like to pose the question to the member, does he feel that, uh, you know, we should now go back and prohibit, uh, make uh, uh, alcohol and, for that matter, tobacco uh, illegal as well, given the logic that he has on, on cannabis? Thank you. L'honorable député de Pont-Neuf, Jacques Cartier. The honorable member for Pont-Neuf, Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my excellent colleague. Indeed, I always do very much enjoy uh, talking with him on the Environment Committee. And despite the uh, language difference between us, I really do appreciate his respect and his attitude, uh, just like I do for all the other members of the committee. To answer his question, I am very reasonable, and I uh, appreciate that he mentioned that in the House. He is entirely right. He has judged me correctly. I'm a reasonable person. Now, if you compare alcohol to drugs, well, that's just, you can't make that comparison. Alcohol is just alcohol, but drugs includes a whole range of toxic and harmful products. It's been shown that marijuana has, it leads to a risk of permanent psychological damage, permanent damage. As far as I know, there's no study that talks about permanent damage from alcohol. When it comes to using drugs under the age of 25, there are many studies that show that there is, there can be permanent harm. Now, in terms of organized crime, I think that this government should have a different position when it comes to this problem. This is a societal problem, you're right, uh, but we need to take the bull by the horns and find new solutions. Let's invest in public awareness campaigns. Let's convince our young people to go, go out and do sports and engage in arts and culture and get involved in other things rather than leaving them to the streets. Let's raise awareness and find solutions and then we won't need to legalize marijuana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Couch and Malahat Langford. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his speech. Uh, I certainly enjoyed serving on the HMCS Vancouver. We were both shipmates for a short time in the Royal Canadian Navy. Um, I, uh, I, I, I enjoyed uh, hearing his support for decriminalization, but the, the one thing I wanted to concentrate was, on was the issue of pardons. Uh, the Prime Minister in a previous interview has admitted that you know, his father was able to use his legal connections uh, in the community to, to get his, his late younger brother off of some charges, but we still have a lot of young people who are affected by charges and criminal records for previous possession charges, and the costs of pardons are quite high. Uh, would he uh, be in support of pressuring this government to institute a pardon or some sort of amnesty for people who had been previously convicted for small amounts of possession of cannabis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Deputy de Pont. The Honourable Member for Pont Neuf, Jacques Cartier. Thank you. I thank my excellent colleague, and I would say that uh, we worked very closely together on that boat uh, in the Canadian Navy. So it was a real privilege for me to to get to know him a bit better. When it comes to his comments on decriminalization. 
I somewhat agree with him. I, I do have a hard time saying that someone who on June 30th, 2018, is accused of having consumed or, or had a marijuana will be called a criminal when somebody who does that on July 1st, you know, the 151st anniversary of Canada, well, that person will be free, won't have any problems. So, Mr. Speaker, I have to say that I do agree with a lot of my colleagues' convictions about decriminalization. Thank you very much. Reprise de débat, resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. And thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, I, I came to this place and I wrote an entire speech, but uh, listening to everybody debate this, listening to some of the questions that have been asked from some of our Liberal members, um, I really feel that it's really important that we have the conversation and just not look at some of the talking points or anything of that sort. And so, like everything I do, I come here as who I am, and that's a mom of five. And so, you know, I'll talk about the way I parent, and I, I, there's a member over there who I, I wish I knew exactly his riding, but we do ride the bus together, so I know every time I have a question about cannabis, I just go to the former chief of police and I ask him everything I need to know. So I do thank him for always having those respectful conversations with me so that I can ask every question I ever have needed to ask. So I would like to put that on the record. <laughs> you know, we talk about it and, and what we have to look at it for our kids. Um, you know, whether we're calling it weed or doobies or blunts or all of those other words that we've heard of briefers, I think what we really have to do is look at how we're approaching this. And it does really concern me because I myself believe that the legislation, is it right or wrong to do this legislation, is, is not the choice I have here, but what are the parts in this legislation that I cannot agree with? So I'll be honest and I'm going to put it, all my cards on the table because I think that's what Canadians are expecting from us. I believe in decriminalizing um, the uh, cannabis. I believe that's a, something that we should look at. And I think it's become, because I have those sit-down family discussions with my kids, with my nieces and nephews, with my parents, because I think the biggest thing we need to recognize, it is out there, and what can we do that's better to serve? Now, I'm not going to say that um, decriminalizing is, is the way I'm going to say that it makes it right, because I don't believe it's the right thing, especially when it comes to our youth. And so I want to go back to this legislation and talk about parts of the legislation that really do need to be tweaked, because I think what, the, what we're doing is we are harming children if we think this legislation is right. And so when I looked at this legislation, there were two parts that I looked at. One it has to do with the age of ability to, to purchase. And as I've indicated, with five children, my youngest is 14, my oldest is 23 years old this year. My 23-year-old my 21-year-old, my 20-year-old, and my 19-year-old are all eligible to now be able to purchase, or as of July 1, 2018, will be eligible to purchase marijuana. Now, I'm not going to ask or tell any about my children's stories, but I can tell you that I have firsthand seen what happens after marijuana use. Whether you're going to see grades drop by 30% or attendance go from perfect to nothing, these things are challenges that parents are having to deal with each and every day. So those are the things that I want to make sure that this government is listening to when we talk about it. We have talked about what happens to children who have smoked marijuana and some of the things that the Canadian Medical Association have come out and talked about with the formation of the brain. I'm really concerned, and as the, the member from Kamloops Thompson had mentioned, you know, their brains aren't developed and the age is 25 years old is what they're saying is, is, is fair. But we had a task force coming out saying 21. And then we had legislation coming out at 18. And I'm going to put it on the record because I believe the only reason that it's at 18 is because that is when you can vote. And I think this is a vote-seeking motion, and I really am really angry about that. You may not, and I'm saying this because I have the right to say this as a parent of five, I am very concerned that you're not taking into consideration or that the government's not taking into consideration what is going to happen to our children. And I, I ask any parent to sit down with their kids and start talking, because that's not what we're doing here. I decided to take this conversation to my family. So I sat down on Easter, you know, when we're all supposed to be selling, celebrating Jesus and all that stuff. We talked about marijuana, because <laughs> I needed to hear from the people that knew best. It was my nephews and my nieces, and the, my sister was a high, school pr or a high school teacher, my sister who is a principal in elementary school, my brother-in-laws who do careers, my other sister-in-law who has worked so hard when it comes to understanding and she actually goes out and counsels families. And so I really had to bring this down to what it really meant. 
And the reason, the moment I said that my son, Christian, who is 14 years of age, would be able to possess marijuana with no charges, that is when the conversation took a totally different turn. Because we all want to protect Christian because he's 14 years of age. But we have to understand that this legislation is not really doing that. We have to understand that we have children who are going to be in grade nine that are going to be in, in high school with people that are going to be 18 years of age, able to buy this, and then the next thing you know, here you go. Here, have a good weekend. Do we not think that this is going to happen? And that's what really frustrates me because let's get it. Sit down and talk to your 14-year-old children and start saying to yourselves, do I want my child to be able to have marijuana on their possession without being charged? Do I want them to know this is right or wrong? I am also very, very concerned with the fact that we're looking at the municipal use of marijuana as well when it comes to when people use it. And I am a huge supporter of municipal marijuana. And that's because I have seen people, and I've lived with somebody who has been on Oxycontin, and I can tell you it has negative, negative effects. So for years, I've advocated on medicinal marijuana. I am very scared that because we legalize marijuana for all Canadians, because let's be honest, once you open it up and say you can get it at 18, you know our 12-year-olds are going to get it for sure as well. Absolutely. Are we going to stop funding the important research that needs to be done so that the people who are using medicinal marijuana are getting the proper strains that they need. And I'm very concerned that we're not going to do that, that we've said we've legalized it, we're going to use the science for all of this other kind of stuff, but are we going to make sure that people who need it the most, who have been using medicinal marijuana for the last number of years, are going to get the proper care that they need? And so I really want to ask this government if they're going to continue to invest in the research for medicinal marijuana. I was very happy yesterday, I was here uh, and listening to the debate, and yesterday and the day before on Bill C-46, which really truly does intertwine with this bill. And you know, I heard actually one of the members from, uh, from the other side comment about the zero tolerance. And so I'm going to mix in with this part as well. We have to understand that if a, ch a person is using marijuana for the first time, that the reaction that they have is going to be extremely different from the person who is a daily smoker for the past 20 years. Yet we're saying this is how we're going to take it and this is, is you know, as long as you have so much on you or grams are going to take you in and, and process it and check the THC levels. Let's be honest here. If a person has had marijuana for the first time and gets behind that wheel, it is a hazard. It is unsafe. They're going to kill themselves or they're going to kill another person. And I think that we have to be sure that we're putting the safety and security of Canadians first. I don't believe that this legislation on Bill C-46 goes far enough but I'm happy that we're going to go back to it. I'm going to go back to my family, and we're going to talk a little bit about, more about kids. We have heard time and time again, whether it's from the Canadian Psychiatric Association, whether it's from the Canadian um, Pediatrics Association, whether it's from the Canadian Medical Association, whether it's from counsellors who have dealt with cannabis for a number of years, we know that we're opening up a Pandora's box. And I am very, very concerned with this because I do not think that we actually have all of the tools that we need in place. I was really happy to see Budget 2017 come out with $5 million for education, but we're going to educate them. And as many of the colleagues have said, we're educating them and the horse is already out of the barn. We're putting the, horse, the cart before, behind the horse. This is very, very simple. People are going to be educated about cannabis after they started smoking it. Let's be honest here. Should we not get it started by where we have the education for our teachers, for our parents, for our children to make sure that they know what they're getting into. It's a safety warning, but we're going to put the safety warnings after they've inhaled. I also was, it was really interesting listening to some of the members also talk about tobacco, and I've heard about tobacco and how we've stopped doing things. Uh, my former boss is part of the Tobacco Transition Fund, and my community, the five communities in southwestern Ontario, were huge in the tobacco industry. We know that there were some really good campaigns that were out there. Yes, of course, we did see a number of adolescents continue to smoke, but people who were older were beginning to quit, and those were some things that we saw as well. We know that campaigns work, so I'm asking this government, why are you putting a campaign about combustible cannabis out after the fact? So I really don't understand that. If we're trying to teach people the problems with marijuana, why would we not be teaching them right from the start? Yeah. We know that combustible things in our lungs is bad for us, just like tobacco. So when are we going to do the education? 
So I am so fearful that this government is so pressing on this, wanting to get through by July 1st of 2018, that they're going to forget about Christian. They're going to forget about Garrett, Hannah, Marissa, and Dakota, my five children. And they're going to forget about everybody else's children because they're more concerned about getting this legislation through because they want an actual promise that they've kept on the 2015 election. I know that there are some very, very, very good MPs over there, and I know that he's known that I'm pointing at him. And I hope and I plead with him as a former police officer to know that me as a parent needs to make sure that this government is going to protect us. This is going to be something that goes through regardless of whether we like it or not. There is a majority government. So I beg this government to know my children are relying on you. The safety of our communities are relying on you. Do it right. Don't do it fast. Thank you very much. Bravo. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Deeply. Very briefly, we only have about, oh, about a minute for questions. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I just have to rise because I, I was uh, deeply uh, offended uh, by the comments opposite. I, I have three children. Most people in this House have children. You have children. You care about their well-being. I care, Mr. Speaker, about their well-being. And the reality is each of us tries to bring to this place the best policies to protect our children and to protect public health. The idea that this was moved uh, for political reasons I think is abhorrent. And I would say the current situation, one-third of children try marijuana before the age of 15. We have the highest prevalence rate in the world. Why does she think the existing system is working? The Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, uh, London, and 30 seconds uh, left. Oh, 30 please. seconds. Well, I won't read this quote, but every doctor in this country, many doctors in this country, have said that it's bad. If we are being told by the Canadian Medical Association that 25 is a good rate, if we're saying 21 is a good rate, that's fine. But I have a gentleman who works for me. His name is Scott. Because it is illegal, he will not try it. I have a staffer for me. Her name is Kaylee. Because it's illegal, she will not try it. I, Karen Vecchio, for years did not do it because it was illegal, and that is sometimes the way we do things. So stop putting your head under. Come on, let's be real. We all want the safety of our children. Uh, before going to private business, private members' business, I want to remind the honourable members that the point of order. I'll just finish up, and then we'll come back if that's okay. Uh, the honourable member for London, Middlesex, uh, Lon uh, London will uh, have uh, approximately three and a half minutes uh, when we return to this item. A point of order, the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to advise that agreements could not be reached under the provisions of Standing Order 78.1 or 78.2 with respect to the second reading stage of Bill C-45, an act respecting cannabis and to amend the Re Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, the Criminal Code and other acts and with respect to the report stage and third reading stage of C-44, an act to implement certain provisions of the budget tabled in Parliament on March 22, 2017, and other measures. Under the provisions of Standing Order 78.3, I give notice that a Minister of the Crown will propose at the next sitting motions to allot a specific number of days or hours for the consideration and disposal of proceedings at the said stages of the aforementioned bills. And Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I would like to inform the House that Thursday, June 8th, shall be an allotted day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.